If I were to tell you that in 12 minutes time you would never have to walk your players through a boring village ever again, how would you feel? Well, my name is Assassin and I want your table to have a good time every time. So today, I will show you how to make a better village in D&D. Now I know some of you might be thinking, why should I bother to make a homebrew village when I can download someone else's? Well, let me tell you, being able to create a village that will make your players want to engage more with your story is one of the most valuable things you as a DM can have. Think about it. Anyone on the internet can slap a few homes together and call it a village. But if you truly want your players to enjoy themselves, then you'll need to create what most fantasy villages lack. A cultural experience that feels real. So how do we turn your village into an exciting encounter that your players will never forget? It's actually more simple than you might think. So today I'm going to give you 10 questions you can answer in order to help you make a better village. If you want to make your own village right now, then grab a pencil and piece of paper and write down your answers to each of these questions as we go along. Or you can watch through it once first and then go through it again later with pen and paper. Now the first question is the most important one we have to answer. This helps set the trajectory for your entire village experience which you will be giving to your players. What is your village's reason for existence? Now this is important to note that the what is the reason for existence matters a whole lot less than the fact that you have a reason for existence. As Runesmith said, the current state of a settlement is the result of all the history that predated it, and now we get to tell a story inside of it. So, let's give your village a reason for existence. I'm going to be making a village alongside of you, so I'm going to be answering each question for myself, and by the end of this video, I will have a village, and hopefully, you will too. I have decided that the reason for my village's existence is that it is a rest stop along a major passageway. Over time, weary travelers kept coming through, houses begin to build up in this area, until now, we have ourselves a village. Take some time to answer this question for yourself. Feel free to pause the video, and when you're ready to answer the next question, press play. The next question we must answer is what is your village's strategic resource? Now a lot of people get this question confused with the first one, which is reason for existence. So let me clarify the difference as succinctly as possible. Your village's reason for existence is why they began, whereas your village's strategic resource is what is keeping them going right now. Let's take a moment to answer this question. For my village's strategic resource, I have decided that they have a very rich soil which allows them to grow the most delicious, juicy, sweet, large strawberries that anyone in the countryside has ever seen. As a result, they use these strawberries to sell and trade with people who come through their village in order to help stimulate their economy and improve their standard of living. Take a moment to answer what is your village's strategic resource. Feel free to pause and press play once you've written it down. The third question we must ask is how big is our village? Most villages range somewhere between 100 to 1,000 citizens. I'm going to put my village right in the middle at 600 people. Take a moment to write down how large your village will be. This will help create atmosphere in your village when your players walk in. Will they walk into a village full, bustling of people, with streets covered in individuals? Or will they show up to a sleepy village with barely anyone outside? Continue on to the next question once you've written down a size for your village. The fourth question we must answer is how wealthy is your village? This will determine your village's amenities, your village's infrastructure, and the overall vibe of your village. For example, a village that is really wealthy may be extra pompous and proud. You may see the citizens walking around with their heads held high, with shiny rings on their fingers and pocket watches in their coats. Whereas a poor village could have the opposite vibe. For my strawberry trade route village, I'm going to say that the citizens are moderately wealthy. The people of my village seem busy, yet driven. The streets are clean and optimized for productivity. Most of the buildings are quite spacious, and there's probably a tall, thick wooden wall that surrounds my village. Now this next question is really the secret sauce that holds everything together in your experience which you will be giving to your players. 
and that is your village's culture. What is the culture of your village? Some fun ways you can add culture to your village includes giving your village charming features such as greetings, nonverbal or verbal. For example, in my village, everyone will greet new travelers with the long-form greeting salutations. And this will give your players plenty of content to think about and even make fun of, which will dramatically increase their engagement over a simple hi or hello. You can also give your village holidays, a religion, and superstitions. For example, in my village, the citizens view finding a coin as good luck, but they view seeing an owl at night as bad luck. Perhaps if one of your players has a pet, you could swap out the owl for that pet. It could create some interesting social encounters with your players and your villagers. Another interesting aspect you can add to your villages if your players are okay with it is racism. There are many races in D&D, and depending on a village's level of isolation, they may not think so favorably of the way your players look. The segment of culture is one of the steps that many online villages miss, and as a result, most players are bored and want to get through the villages they find as fast as possible. But by using culture, you can create exciting experiences that your players will never forget. The next question we must ask ourselves is what buildings will be in your village? Now most people start planning their village here, and this is a big mistake. Because in order to create a convincing village, we want our buildings to be based off of our reason for existence, our strategic resources, the size of our village, the wealth of our village, and the culture of our village. For example, maybe every single building in your village has a silly steeple on top to keep ghosts away. You might mention this weird building feature as your players enter into the village, and for the rest of their time in this village, they will constantly be asking themselves, why on earth are there these weird steeples on every single house? Could they be lightning rods? Or perhaps their antennas? By not giving them the answer right away, you create intrigue which will increase your player engagement. It's important to note that you do not need to think of every single building that will be in your village at this point, only a few strategic ones. So based off the answers you have already, let's take a moment to pause the video and ask the question, what key and important buildings and features will we be including in our village today? Some common buildings include the alehouse, bakery, barns for food storage, a chief's house, a guard post, a healing house, homes, a marketplace or a trading hall, a meeting hall, a mill, a religious altar or shrine, and a tailor or seamstress. Now it's time to fill our village with villagers. Are there any important villager NPCs we would like to include in our village for our players to meet? Our goal is not to populate our village, but just to prepare two or three. I will soon be releasing a villager maker on my website, along with all of my other free world building PDF downloads designed to help you have a good time every time. You can find all my free downloads, link in description. We don't need to go too crazy into our villager creation, all you really need is a name, an occupation, and a shallow personality. Perhaps if you really want to go the extra mile, you could think about giving some of your NPCs quests in which they could ask your players for help. For example, maybe Granny Norma needs help locating her missing son. The eighth question we must ask ourselves is what does your village's external environment look like? These are the natural areas surrounding your village. The external environment could make your players want to stay inside of your village. Perhaps your village is surrounded by lava lakes or acid pools. Or maybe your external environment could make your players want to venture outside of your village if there are rare and valuable plants or treasures or gemstones or creatures which they can hunt. So take a moment to pause the video and briefly describe your village's external environment. Now answering question number 9 will be a great way to consume your players' minds as this question will help you capture your players' attention in a very meaningful but sneaky way. And the question is, what are the rumors you can spread about your village? Perhaps it's juicy gossip the villagers have about their leaders, or it could be gossip about the external environment. Using rumors can be a great way to set up side quests or even main quests if done correctly. An example of gossip amongst villagers could be that the blacksmith recently received a really large inheritance. Too large. Perhaps a rumor for the external environment could be that there's a local Nessie in the nearby lake that's been eating children. 
In the words of King Solomon, the words of a gossip merely reveal the wounds of his own soul. If you really want to capture your player's attention, you could include rumors of treasure in the nearby areas. Perhaps there's rumors of a magical compass lost in the ocean depths off your coastal village. So take a moment to pause the video and write down any number of rumors you can think that you would like to include in your village. You don't have to use all of your rumors, but it's always nice to have a list to draw from once you're in session. Now that we have everything else, we can finally answer our 10th question. Unfortunately, many DMs are guilty of starting here. The final question for our village is... What kind of encounters shall we include? If you start with this question before answering the previous nine, you may have a strong encounter, but it will be in a very weak setting, kind of like a giant, beautifully made house on a muddy foundation. No matter how beautiful the house is, everyone starts asking questions when the house starts to sink. But since you've been writing down your answers as we've been going along, we can now give your village encounters. Perhaps your players encountered two dogs fighting over a bone, or a young fellow kissing a young girl. Maybe a crow poops on one of your players' heads, or a territorial wasp nest feels threatened and begins to attack your players as they walk under a low-hanging tree. Take a moment to pause the video and fill your village with a few encounters. And now, you have everything you need to make a better village. The thing is, although making better villages will help you, the more world building tricks you have up your sleeve, the better. So make sure you watch this video next to take what you just learned and add to it some of the most powerful ways to create lasting memories your players will love.